First off, thanks everybody for uh, sticking with it and uh, hanging out. I know it's been a long day with a lot of really interesting <laughs> talks. Uh, first, I also want to thank the organizers and especially SmartGate uh, for having me. It's uh, really appreciated. I love discovering um, Armenia. So thank you. <laughs> so so uh, you might have guessed based on my accent that I'm not Estonian, in case you uh, are familiar with Estonia. Um, I'm actually an American, and uh, I'll give you a little bit of my background so you kind of understand how I ended up working for the Estonian government. Um, and then also then I'll go into background about the e-residency program itself, and then, um, and then a little bit about kind of my learnings of uh, what I've found throughout my history in startups, and then uh, throughout my history of uh, working for the Estonian government, which has been uh, relatively short, but it's been uh, really intriguing. So uh, I kind of <laughs> have always been an entrepreneur when it comes down to it. I, you know, <laughs> you could say I started my first formal company at 18 right when I entered college. But um, I actually, my first entrepreneurial experience was buying big packs of gum at the corner store before I got to, uh, before I got to middle school and then breaking them apart and selling them uh, individually to my classmates. So I've always kind of been the stereotypical hustle, hustler sales entrepreneur guy, right? Um, I, uh, uh, when, I, when I got to college, I competed in a lot of startup competitions and mentored a lot um, for startups and for helping uh, younger people who were interested in, in startups and that kind of in entrepreneurship. Um, and I quickly became, uh, I worked for the Small Business Administration for the American government, um, advising companies ranging from like uh, uh, a Native American reservation to drone companies to bars and restaurants on how they could uh, grow their business. And then after university, I was uh, hired by the company as a chief marketing officer. Uh, from there, I moved to, uh, they brought me down to Silicon Valley. Actually, that's where I was born originally. But um, uh, they brought me down to Silicon Valley, and then I started getting into the volunteering, uh, volunteer thing again uh, for StartX, which is the s accelerator for Stanford students. Um, actually, it's for, uh, it's for everyone kind of affiliated with Stanford. I mean, we had professors, students, uh, alums, uh, just about everyone in there. And I was helping with marketing, growth, and kind of how they could grow the program, how they could bring in high quality founders, and then vetting them to make sure that uh, the quality was up to speed. Um, and then after that, I decided I wanted to work on my own business again. I joined Draper University, uh, run by Chin Tim Draper, first as a student working on my own idea, and then afterwards as a mentor, um, and then, of course, working on some other stuff. Uh, unfortunately, the, the company I was working on kind of was uh, fundamentally flawed as a business, unfortunately, as a hardware device. And um, if you're interested in kind of how you can learn whether there's market fit before your product, before you uh, rack up a bunch of credit card bills and spend all your money, there's a great presentation tomorrow at uh, 3 o'clock, I think, Yeah, uh, about how you can do, do just that. So uh, I, I decided to join another startup, so or sorry, a venture capital firm, so I could learn kind of uh, well, how the other side thought, essentially, because I had a hard time raising money. So I joined Fenox Venture Capital, which was down in uh, San Jose. And um, we, they had about a billion dollars uh, under asset, in assets under management. Um, and it was quite an interesting experience there working on. The biggest major deal I was working on was a robotics company out of MIT called Jibo um, on their Series B round. Uh, but my, my was kind of AI and um, uh, machine learning technologies. and then. After that, I wanted to get back into early stage founder and startup stuff. Uh, once it's in your blood, it's pretty hard to, to get it out. Uh, and then so I joined Gigster, which had just graduated from Y Combinator back in uh, uh, 2015. And then uh, so I was employee nine there, but working there since pretty much, I think, three months after it was founded and worked on everything from growth to partnerships to uh, helping build a sales team there. Um, and it was incredible. We were ended up being backed by Andreessen Horowitz, Bloomberg, Greylock, uh, even Michael Jordan and Ashton Kutcher were our investors at a uh, certain point. So uh, it, was, it was a really uh, fun experience scaling from nine people to close to 70, 75 by the time I left. And um, I, I had decided that I wanted to get back into even earlier stage uh, because, you know, once you're back at uh, 75 people or so, you don't know everyone's name and birthday and uh, where they're coming from. So uh, I wanted to get back in the early stage. So I joined um, Rocket Internet, which is a company builder uh, based out of Berlin, um, and moved from Silicon Valley to Germany. Uh, and from there, uh, I, didn't, I didn't spend too long. I'll talk a little bit about kind of uh, why values are so important and why w doing what you care about and having passion for things is so important when you're building a business. But um, 
But uh, I decided to kind of get back to my fundamentals of what I cared about when I was, after I moved to Germany, which was uh, kind of government innovation was a core thing that I always was very interested in. I had volunteered for actually one of Tim Draper's organizations as well, focused on um, government innovation when I was in the Valley. And then so just to give you some background on, uh, on Estonia, and despite it saying history, I promise it won't be a very long history lesson. There's really two really important things to remember is that uh, the Republic of Estonia was established in 1918, and we regained our independence in 1991. And so this is a little better photo that shows you kind of geographically where it is. So it's only uh, 45,000 square kilometers uh, as a country, home, home to 1.3 million people. Uh, but it's, it's a really fascinating nation. So it borders uh, Finland and Russia as well as Latvia. Um, and, but when it comes to style, actually the language is only similar to Finnish and Finnish is also only similar to Estonian. And so it's a very interesting kind of uh, culture there. And it's much more Scandinavian than kind of, um, than kind of uh, Baltic when it comes to culture. But, but uh, the Estonians are very proud of kind of the history and like a long history of trade with both Russia, Latvia, and of course very strong ties with Finland. And we're a proud member of uh, the EU and NATO and we're home to uh, the, one of the cybersecurity excellence centers. But uh, as I mentioned, the, the country regained sovereignty in 1991, but with that comes uh, a lot of challenges. So in 1991, essentially uh, after, after years of occupation, um, we lost all our infrastructure. So when you regain, when you regain independence, of course, uh, the last government doesn't leave all their stuff and a lot of money for you to get started. Uh, so, so basically, we were 1.3 million people in a nation of 45,000 some square kilometers that are pretty dispersed that had to come up with a way to not only uh, rebuild government services, but service all these people. And we decided that, and actually really we were very fortunate in kind of the timing because that year was also the year the first servers for the World Wide Web were, were searched on that were kind of available to the public. So we decided that from the start we would become kind of a, a different kind of nation, nation focused on digital and focused on the future. And so what that looks like today, and actually this is a fun side, and it's very indicative of kind of how the, the government thinks is that we basically doubled down on the digital experience and serving, uh, serving our customers, which are our uh, e-residents and our actual residents, um, with, with services from, uh, uh, on entirely digital. Of course, uh, something that comes up often is, well, what happens to people who uh, are elderly or don't want to, uh, don't want to use mobile or, or don't want to use the web or think that there's something wrong with that? Of course, there's public services, but we made it so easy to use public services ranging from, actually, it's, it's about 99% of services are available online and it's so easy to use them that it's pretty much a no-brainer for everyone. For instance, uh, taxes in Estonia from a personal standpoint take about five minutes to file entirely online because they're mostly pre-filled because everything is done uh, transparently through the uh, through the Estonian government system whereas compared to the US and German taxes I just filed my US tax return like six months late and it's costing hundreds of dollars and my German tax re returns personally cost over a thousand years so it's a uh, it's a major difference and actually setting up the country this way has continued to create amazing results. The Estonian government saves about 2% of its annual GDP, which uh, for Estonia in absolute terms is not so much, but if you compare that to the GDP of Germany or the US or many nations, 2% is an insane amount of, of their budget. So in terms of services, I, I mentioned 99%, and I'll just quickly mention there's, there's only actually three things you really can't do online in Estonia, and that's uh, get married, get divorced, and buy property. And those aren't uh, technological issues. We just, uh, there's some things that you want someone to kind of uh, nudge you and say, are you, are you sure about this? And uh, especially getting married is one of those. So. <laughs> um, and this is, uh, this is, this is uh, one of our ID cards that basically enables everything that we do online. So I mentioned you access government services, but the way you do that is you're assigned kind of a, a digital, you're assigned an ID number, and then you get a plug-in. You can, uh, in Estonia, a lot of the laptops have uh, card readers that you can just plug in, but of course there's a USB port. So if you're doing online banking, there's usually a login where you just plug in your card. Uh, if you're doing anything like uh, if you want to check your health records, if you want to buy a car, if you want to do anything like that, you just pop in your card and you can do most everything online. So. 
uh, that, that kind of uh, creative infrastructure and actually forced out of necessity <coughs> has enabled Estonia to be number one in a lot of different ways when it comes to uh, uh, advances as a nation. We're the first country to declare internet access as a human right, first for internet freedom in the world, first for ca tax competitiveness, first among Europe's uh, most entrepreneurial nations by the WEF, uh, and first in Europe uh, to legalize new technology. We very much have kind of continued our culture of forward thinking um, in terms of uh, how we structure government to continue today. I mean, I, I frequently talk to uh, uh, our AI chair who basically advises the prime minister on AI matters and they're very much uh, forward thinking when it comes to not only um, allowing uh, technology infrastructure like smart, like uh, self-driving cars and uh, artificial intelligence, but enabling it so it's legal through government. I mean, I think even in places in the U.S. where U Uber was founded, it's probably still operating in a legal gray area, whereas in Estonia, those sort of things are handled by the government as they come out. And so uh, because of this environment, Estonian companies also benefit from a wide range of access to public and private e-services. We work as a government very, very closely with the private sector. We strongly believe that uh, to, in, a, in order to deliver the technologies and the infrastructure that people need, you need to work with the private sector in order to, uh, in order to build things that are really customer centric and provide the most value that they can. Um, an open, transparent and stable uh, business environment. When, when almost everything you do from a government, from taxes, from forming businesses is open and available online, it lends itself for a transparent and very trustworthy environment because of course you trust someone when you can easily verify uh, that they own the car that they're selling you, that they own the business and are a director of the company that they purport that they work for, you know, th things like that. And um, we also, uh, one of the, you know, kind of proud things of e-residency is 100% online company management. Uh, we have customers from uh, over 150 nations that use, that are e-residents and over 5,000 businesses that are enabled by e-residency. And many people sign up from outside the EU or even inside the EU so they can be digital nomads, so they can get access to the European business environment. So even as simple as uh, getting access to PayPal if it's not available in your country yet, right? Um, so <laughs> what, what is e-residency? I mean, I talked a little bit about kind of the Estonian ecosystem as, as a whole, but e-residency is kind of the idea of a gateway. So we, we were formed as a nation building these digital products and being for, very forward thinking when it comes to, you know, kind of layering them on top of uh, the web. But, you know, the, the principle of web and the fundamental principles of technology around that are that they're highly scalable, right? I mean, the web doesn't support 1.3 million people and cap out. I mean, you can build services that reach 10 million, 100 million, a billion people or, or more. Um, and so that was kind of the line of thinking that said, okay, what if we open up our nation to everyone, right? Um, so we basically launched e-residency as a program, allowing everyone access to our now digital and borderless nation and to get access to our services. But what we, what we quickly found was that it, uh, you know, we kind of just opened the floodgates and said, what, what's going to happen here? Um, and we had thousands of people sign up uh, because they thought it was cool or they wanted the, the concept to, to kind of take off. But we found that most people found uh, the most use from it from forming businesses of their own, running them remotely from wherever they happen to be in the world. And so this, this is one of my, my favorite photos. Uh, we're, we're really proud as an organization to have kind of helped put Estonia on, on, on the front page and in forefront of people's minds when it comes to digital excellency and uh, kind of government innovation. So Angela Merkel is an e-resident, uh, Shinzo Abe is an e-resident, Tim Draper, Steve Jurvetsen, uh people like that. And um, actually, I, as an American, uh, when I tell people I work in Estonia uh, for the e-residency program, I usually get kind of one of two responses. One is like, uh, where's Estonia? Uh, and the, the second one is, oh, e-residency, I've heard of that, that's pretty cool. So it's, uh, it's really cool to kind of work for an organization that's, that's a hallmark of, uh, of a country. And, um, but, but, you know, why, why do I work for the e-residency program as an American? Of course, you know, maybe I should be working for, for my own gov government and helping them. But I, I think the, the values behind e-residency are really what drew me and a lot of people on the team. We're actually about 50% international who work for the e-residency program. Um, and the one that speaks to me especially is uh, inclusivity. Every person on the planet has the right to join our digital nation. It's not about who you, where you're from. It's not about what religion you are. It's not about how rich or poor you are, uh, whether you get to join. It's about being part of something new and about innovating and about breaking through. Um, and we, we kind of have a saying that, you know, 
whether other people in the world are building walls and putting up barriers, we're, we're trying to tear them down and make the world a little bit more accessible. And then, um, <laughs> and then I'll talk about le legitimacy. Uh, E-Resident is a government-backed program uh, from Estonia, obviously, but when you apply, you also go through um, a background check by our police and border guard, uh, similar to if you were applying for a visa. So it's very much uh, kind of a legitimate check on whether you're an individual. When you go pick up your card, you get your fingerprints done and you, uh, you have to kind of meet people physically. Um, to make sure that you are who you say you are. Um, it's transparent. As I mentioned, this is, this is a core value of e-residency, but it's really a core value of the Estonian government as a whole. When you're asking people to put so much faith in you to store your health records, to store your financial data, to store, I mean, everything about them as a person with their unique digital identity, you should be pretty dang transparent about how you're using that data and why you're using it. So even going as far as um, every time, so for instance, my health care records are online on my portal that's uh, linked to my identity card, um, I can go see whenever anyone has accessed that data. So if someone I think shouldn't, uh, shouldn't have seen my data, I can make an inquiry into why they were given access and I can actually find out you know, what, what the deal was behind that, right? Um, and then empowering. This, this goes right along uh, hand in hand with inclusivity, but e-residency is about democratizing access to entrepreneurship. Um, you know, for, for me and a lot of people in the program, we were very lucky to be born in Europe or the US or other places where uh, the business environment was very stable, where there weren't currency fluctuations, where you, you had opportunities and very strong opportunities to become an entrepreneur. And e-residency for us is about kind of leveling the playing field so everyone gets access to that, right? Um, so now I'll, I'll, I'll chat about this. I, I touched on this earlier. We, uh, we are a global digital nation, but as I mentioned, uh, the people who we found have the most value out of the program right now uh, are people who want to run a global business in the, EU, uh, in the EU environment. So we have digital nomads from Germany who uh, travel the world usually to places warmer and sunnier than, uh, than Estonia. So we have a lot of guys hanging out in you know, Thailand and Malta and Colombia and uh, places like that that are running their business through e-residency. We have people in, uh, well, we have people probably in this room. We have people from over 150 nations that are kind of enabled to build their businesses and you know, uh, live their lives uh, through the e-residency program, which we're really proud to uh, have helped facilitate. Um, which brings me to kind of my last point of what is, what is the future of e-residency. There's, today we've kind of created this bridge that allows you to access Estonian e-services and with a focus on the business environment. So the next step for us is building an ecosystem of, of tools, partners, promoters that allow you not only to uh, start your business but then to grow it. Because of course the next step once you've formed your business is you know, how do I make money, how do I grow my business, how, how do I become, uh, you know, well depends on, on what you want to be, maybe not in the next phase book anymore, but you know, maybe the next Tesla or something like that, right? Um, creating a new community platform. We, we have about 40,000 e-residents and 5,000 business owners from across the world, and they're quite often in Facebook groups, WhatsApp groups from their nations or from across the world sharing advice on how to grow their business, about who they should be buying products from, trying to buy things from one another. So we're rolling out tools to kind of help facilitate that, and that also goes along with uh, building an ecosystem for um, enabling people to grow their business. And then uh, expanding our solution to new markets. We're as a as an agency and as a program, we're very focused on kind of the the digital aspect of things, and that's really where we play is enabling people digitally to run their business to do it all remotely, right? But unfortunately, or you know, in, in some cases, fortunately, we do depend on physical. I mean, we're we're human beings. We live in the physical world, and for uh, specifically for background checks and making sure that you are who you say you are, and kind of completing the first step in the process, you need to pick up your card from a designated pickup point, which is an embassy, right? Um, and for us, the closest one is in Georgia uh, from here, but we're working actively, uh, very actively, on expanding the number of those so we can kind of help reach our customers and make it easier to for them to join. And then this is another point that I really love about the program is getting more governments to comp compete and improving the quality of governance globally. You might think, uh, you know, we, we get a lot of people, you know, almost almost every time I, I speak at a conference or go somewhere, uh, someone comes up to me and say, well, why, you know, why can't I just copy your program? And we say, you, you should. Uh, we would love you to. Um, we, we actively host delegations from anywhere in the world, from ranging from governments to big businesses, trying to innovate and trying to be more efficient. Because we, you know, as an 
as an international team and also just kind of the character of the team, you know, for more people to innovate in this space, to compete in this space, it kind of ra raises the tide for everyone, for, for the rest of us who want better government services, who want it, an easier time starting a business, running a business, who want, you know, <laughs> who, who want things to be easier and to, to be done better, right? And of course, as I mentioned before, the last point is uh, the democratization of, of uh, entrepreneurship globally and in, and, uh, double and, um, and an end to uh, financial exclusion. Um, personal takeaways. So I just, I, you know, I, I wanted to share a little bit about kind of what I've found over the last, well, longer, longer, uh, longer than the last couple of years of, of working in startups and working for the government um, and working on various things. So um, when, you, when you're building products, and I'll talk about this from a broad perspective of both, you know, kind of, I wanted to make it applicable to startups and government, is that um, these things take patience. I mean, you know, there's, we, we have a saying, right, uh, Rome wasn't built in a day, and it's true. You know, good things, good things take time, and it always reminds me, whenever I'm kind of frustrated with the rate of when of how things are going or how quickly we can do things it's I'm reminded of kind of the Airbnb story of like how for for several years I mean they were almost uh, running out of business and running out of money and then they ended up selling cereal at uh, the DNC convention or and then online uh, to keep their business going and now Airbnb is one of the most uh, one of the most highly valued uh, private companies in the world and, and a name we all know so building people uh, building things that matter take time it takes resources it takes collaboration and a community um, trust uh, th this is one thing you know I want to talk about this this is kind of a some, something that you should have as a person, I believe, and it's very powerful to me, is surrounding yourself with people you trust and being a trustworthy person. If you, you know, some, something I found in Silicon Valley was that uh, we, often, we often funded people um, when I was at a VC firm who had failed before, if we had seen them try before and they were trustworthy and they acted in good faith. Like, businesses fail all the time, ideas fail all the time. We as human beings fail at our goals all the time. But if you are a genuine person and you care about people and you're working towards a goal that you care about, people see that and, you know, they, they want to be around those people and they want to help those people. And of course, if you're, if you're one of those people, you usually like hanging out with that same crowd too. So it kind of, it kind of builds on, it kind of builds on itself, right? And then uh, focus. This is, this is something that, that I've also seen um, kind, of, kind of the negative side of uh, a lot of times. You know, it's, it's really awesome to get written about in TechCrunch or a magazine or whatever or have a thousand people subscribe. But if you don't know where you're trying to go or what your goals are, it's going to be really easy to get sidetracked by, you know, vanity metrics, by shiny objects that don't really matter to you, to your goals, to your business. So knowing what you're trying to achieve is really important kind of from the outset. Um, uh, values. So this is this is totally based on who you are as a person. But for me, life is too short to do things that don't fit your values and don't make you happy. And I'm not I'm not trying to say you know uh, whenever things get hard, it's time to move on to the next thing that makes you happy and like has that quick burst of endorphins or uh, adrenaline. You know I'm you know of course I, I'm really happy when I you know. Uh, when I get to do you know fun things, but um, startups and and starting big projects are really really hard. But if you're doing things that you really care about, if you're doing things that fit your values of who you are as a person, um, it makes it a lot easier to kind of uh, to kind of get through the hard times, right? And when you're doing things that don't fit your values, you at least you know when when I've done this before, I, I feel bad, right? I feel bad when I'm acting or doing things that I don't really believe in. Um, the, the last point I'll touch on here is community. Uh, having a strong network of supporters, friends, people who are ready to help uh, are, is one of the most powerful things you can ever have. I mean, um, I, I, know, I know these guys from my time at uh, Draper University and you know, having connections and having people that care about you, that are willing to help and that you can try and help in return is super powerful uh, for when you're running a business or for when you're doing anything in life really. And it also goes back to my point about trust. You, know, you, you wanna surround yourself with people you can trust that when times get hard, if things get, you know, get rough, uh, that the community and the people you surrounded yourself with are going to be there and going to help you. You, right, and then the the last the last uh, the last thing I'll I'll say is I I don't know as much about Armenia as I'd like to, but the, these are kind of some points that that I saw during my research of uh, that I would share for in terms of advice, and this is more on the government side um, than than on the startup side. But uh, leapfrogging, this is something that you know I I always I always have a little bit of a chuckle because uh, you know even even my home well. Uh, 
you know, my, my state of Nevada where I lived for you know, 10 plus years of my life, uh, you know, we, we always want to be the Silicon Valley of something, you know, where, where the Silicon Slopes or the Silicon whatever, right? Uh, and I think, I think it's important to, um, that, that you don't have to, oh, sorry, I jumped a, I, I jumped a bullet point, uh, that, that you don't have to, that you don't have to always uh, emulate. You can, um, you can, look to your own advantages. I mean, I know Armenia has a really strong IT community and a really strong engineering presence. So using things like that to build on top of, uh, uh, to build as kind of unique value proposition is really important. For, for the leapfrogging approach, the, the example I'll use is kind of um, how I, going to China for, for me. So if you, go to, if you go to China today, it's a very different experience when you're checking out at a store or purchasing something. Almost everything is mobile. There's very little, I mean, uh, I, I was recently reading a blog about a person who tried to use cash and people just didn't understand what he was trying to do and like uh, just just couldn't understand why you would use cash when you would use your mobile phone, right? So I would say, you know, when, when you're looking to Estonia and looking about uh, what we did as a nation, don't, don't just, you know, kind of emulate our example, but actually leapfrog us. If, if we were building today, uh, if we were building a new digital nation and it wasn't 91, it was 2018, what would we be doing? Would it be fundamentally based on mobile technology? Would it be based on the blockchain? Would it be based on artificial intelligence and kind of uh, predicting what people would want or, or actively doing services for them? I mean, there's, there's a lot of options. Um, and then the last point I'll leave you with is starting global. Um, the, the world is becoming much more open and much, uh, and much easier to reach. And I'm talking about this more in terms of, um, uh, more in terms of the companies that, that are going after. I mean, you see Uber penetrating huge numbers of market. You see Airbnb, all these companies kind of become global behemoths much faster than it used to be, where, where a kind of distinct local advantage could be preserved for decades, if not, if not more. Um, so what I would say is kind of fundamentally start global. There's always going to be uh, a stronghold where you can kind of build your base in the community you understand best. I mean, I think uh, a good example is like Gigi, right? Where, where Yandex was coming in and, um, and they kind of lost a foothold to Gigi because they understood their community a little bit better. But at the same time, if you're also not thinking global, those people will figure out how to, how to uh, understand the cultural nuances of, of a community. So if you're not thinking global from the beginning and about how you can jump into new markets, uh, that's going to be that's going to be an issue for you as kind of your business, right? And so uh, that's all for my presentation. I wanted to leave as much time as I could for um, questions, just in case you know people wanted to talk about something uh, specific. So, thank you. Please. So um, I'm an e-resident, e an Estonian one. I haven't grabbed my identity card from Tbilisi yet. Uh, and uh, I've read some blog posts, some steps, but uh, just wanted to confirm, what do you think? Like, I'm planning to start a little business in yeah. Estonia, uh, mostly for testing purposes, to be really frank with yeah. you, because I'm a journalist. <laughs> awesome. I'm, I'm trying to understand if uh, within the next one year, how much money should I invest in to keep the cost minimal and let's say starting a small web hosting company. Yeah, so uh, I, I'd say that the average cost we see, so there's the 100 euro fee to get the card, uh, which covers the cost of the background check of issuing the card. We have to send it through diplomatic post. And then of course of uh, the cost of the embassy issuing it. Um, and the card lasts for five years. So once every five years, you'll have that expense. Uh, if you start a business, there's two ways to do it. You can do it yourself uh, through the business registry portal. Um, and that, that fee is 195 euro uh, to, to actually register your business. Um, what we see people commonly do though is use a service provider who also helps structure kind of your accounting and uh, you know, in case you want to employ people and in case you want to do that sort of thing. Um, and we usually strongly recommend that just because, I mean, they know, they know all the ins, of, ins and, out of, and outs of the program, right? Um, and, and about the Estonian kind of environment and how to set things up. So what we see people's average cost are is around uh, 600 euros a year for running a business, and that includes um, accounting, a little bit of taxation, and uh, services like your virtual address, which you'll, which you'll need to run your business. So, yeah. Please. Uh, 
State University Department of Statistics. So this year I graduated and my uh, project was uh, happiness score in the countries. So can you say about what is the difference between just let us to compare Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia and I see uh, that GDP is very similar in these three countries. So what is the features of Estonia and the year residents? When it comes to happiness in particular or in general? Uh, just a, a word report about happiness in the countries. Mm. Uh, Estonian people seem pretty happy to me. <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know so much about happiness in particular. I, I, think, I think it's, uh, the, the countries have very much uh, a, a lot of things in similar uh, in uh, in common, right? So, so I mean, they're they're Baltic nations. They're around the similar size. They have, like you said, I, I believe around a similar GDP. Although I think uh, uh, monthly salary is usually a little bit higher in Estonia in terms of uh, income level for individuals. I'd say what's a little bit different is that um, we kind of started fundamentally as working towards digital first uh, when it came to government services and things like that. Whereas uh, right now I'm. Uh, actually, I, I, might, I might be mixing it up, but I think Latvia is building blockchain solutions to make it easier to launch, um, to launch companies in, in that vertical and to do things digitally. I think we, we have a little bit of an advantage just because we started earlier, but they're definitely uh, moving quickly to, to catch up. And I think, we, like I said, we share a lot of similarities in terms of geography, in terms of the size of the countries, and in terms of uh, shared historical backgrounds. So. Yes, I would like to say that why Estonia was chosen, not Georgia or Armenia or Azerbaijan, just Iron Georgia and even Armenia, uh, what uh, privileges had Estonia to be, to have such program as a residence? Uh, I, I don't... I you know, I, I don't know of his privileges per se. I think I think at the beginning it was more just uh, a couple a couple people that were kind of starting the new the new nation after uh, uh, after after we became independent again. Kind of made this de decision um, that we were going to be a, a digital first nation, and then it kind of snowballed, right? I mean, once you once you kind of go that route, it's very hard to kind of switch back, as many countries see from the opposite side, right? In the U.S. or Germany, to digitize the nation, it'd be near impossible. So I think it's not, mm, I, I wouldn't say it's so much like an advantage or something that they had. I think it was just kind of years of compounded uh, interest in a way that, that of building digital services allowed us to kind of quickly snap our fingers and roll out this program. I mean, it was, uh, uh, the, the, the program itself isn't really like a technology innovation, it's, it's a policy innovation. Uh, so I would like to say that I admire with Estonia because just I have read that uh, maybe 10 years before they have Wi-Fi in deep uh, villages and all other persons have internet, all libraries, and I am just crying about Armenia because we have no internet in our libraries, we have no free internet as they have. So just I would like to have such program in Armenia and Georgia. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Uh, about the uh, sort of the openness to all citizens of the world, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, uh, uh, is it open to Iranians? Uh, I, I believe Iranians. There's no problem to to, to apply for the e-residency, as as far as I'm aware. Um, but we still, for the for the background check, the background st check still has to be done. So there is, I'd say, I'd say really the major difficulty I would expect if you're an Iranian is uh, is starting a business because then you run into if you need to open a bank account, you're running against. Uh, the fast r rules for the EU and things like that. So it's going to be very difficult to actually use the card in any real way uh, to, to do anything beneficial. I, I'm asking mostly because I think any value to, to cloning the program in Armenia would uh, include uh, opening, you know, making it attractive to Iranians. Mm, interesting. So, uh, now, I just want to talk about the scenario, ask about the scenario. Let's say I have a SaaS business, mm -hmm. I register it there, uh, maybe I even incorporate it there, um, and then the revenue starts coming in. And now what kind of taxes am I liable for, and, and, and was this a good idea, and if it wasn't, if it was a good idea for the start, but wasn't a good idea for the long term, yeah. how do I get out of it, <laughs> right? uh, and should I have done it in Switzerland and not been cheap? Yeah. 
uh, or, or UK Limited, or yeah. maybe just CJSC in Armenia. Yeah. Uh, that, that brings up a really important point. If you're, if you're going to do a business and you're going to have revenue and you're going to have you know, uh, any, anything kind of serious, please, please uh, do your research beforehand. There's, um, there's lots of ways to structure your business in the most tax-friendly way in, in ways that may mo make more sense to you than, than others. Um, I'd say, so let, let's take the first scenario. If, if you're starting a business, I'd say first consult about that because I, I, don't, I don't love giving tax advice because it gets super complicated really quickly depending on your situation. Um, I'd say very likely, it, and it also depends if there's a dual tax treaty. We do have one with Armenia. Um, so you won't, you won't get double taxed on certain things. Um, I'd say, yeah, I, I'd say please consult, consult a, a tax advisor. If you have customers from all over the world and maybe you have employees in Estonia, your, your taxation um, situation is probably going to be much more beneficial than if, say, you had an Estonian company but all your value created and your permanent residency was, say, in like uh, Germany or, or some other kind of high tax environment because if you're, if you're in one of those environments and you have permanent residency, all your customers are there, uh, you're likely paying your taxes there rather than in Estonia. So we don't, as, as a government agency, we don't expect you to pay very many taxes in Estonia because very often uh, you pay where value is generated. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. Uh, if, you, if you already have a business, um, there are ways to, uh, well, there, there are ways to just purely liquidate. It takes about six months, not of active work, but it takes that long. You have to settle your debts and make sure that, uh, well, basically you can't have open liabilities or open pending things, um, as the same with most businesses, right? Um, uh, and then I, I guess you would just move you would just move corporate entities, or maybe there's a way to structure it by uh, opening your UK limited company and then running things through there and then selling the ownership or something. But that that gets a little bit more complicated. Yeah. And I'm happy to uh, chat with you after if you have kind of more like very specific things for sure. Yeah, I mean concretely for most of us, I think the scenario would be you're based in Armenia, your dev team is in Armenia. Yeah. Um, but you know you're sort of officially uh, have some presence. In Estonia. Yeah, and in that case, it's a little different. So, if you have employees there in Estonia, it gets it becomes more different. Uh, it, it becomes different from a tax liability standpoint. If you have customers from places outside of Armenia, it becomes a little bit different. Um, I would need to look into kind of the regulations of the local environment because they do differ from the EU uh, to other countries. But um, yeah, it's please please definitely consult uh, a tax advisor or do a little bit more research. And there are other people in the group that can also. Uh, we have a large Facebook community that's very helpful too. But uh, feel free to. Uh, my, my email's not up there, but it's just uh, joel.burke at eas.ee, and I can give you my card after if you have questions, and I can try and find uh, the right people to put you in touch with. And yeah. Do you hear me? Ah. Yeah. Um, I'm Jess. Um, I just wanted to ask about the elder, elderly people. You touched base on that uh, question, and how did you incorporate uh, e-governance into their lives? Because it's like whenever I'm thinking about Armenia and the people here, mm -hmm. uh, it's it would be nearly impossible mm. to. I I think it was kind of like uh, two core things um, that, that come to mind initially. It's one is education and the other is incentives, right? So uh, the education piece is mainly around, or, and, and enablement is a little bit, you know, as, uh, as you, as uh, was mentioned before, you know, having Wi-Fi accessible in a lot of different places allowed people uh, to kind of figure things out and mess around for themselves and it kind of, you know, um, the internet is such a part of most of people's lives. They they have some familiarization with it, and then uh, making your products super simple to use is also a core p piece of uh, the government infrastructure. So you, if it's easier to use than Facebook, it makes it a little easier sell uh, to these people. But also training, so uh, providing education, providing. Um, uh, yeah, basically providing training on how to use the projects and how to do these things. Um, it was also quite important. Um, and then, of course, we never actually eliminated all the facilities. If you, if you wanted to go to uh, your public registrar or to do the services in person, of course, you, of course you still can. For most people though, it's just, it was built so easily and so accessibly that it's just no question that they would just do it on their phone or on the web, right? Um, and then I'd say incentives. So uh, 
there's there's definitely I'd say the the core incentive is probably ease of use now. Of course, there's other incentives you can build into products or our government. So, for instance, something something I've uh, heard is that you know. It, it costs less as a government to do things digitally most often um, if you're doing them correctly rather than having paper based having more people in an office physically right so you could for instance uh, you know if you have a DMV equivalent like where, where you're registering your car for sale or picking up license plates or things like that um, if you need to go in person you could basically uh, maintain the same cost as it is today but if the person registered online they could get you know a 50% discount or whatever it is right so you basically like uh, incentivize the behavior um, in order to get people used to it and get people motivated to do it themselves. Because, I mean, ha habits are hard to change, right? If someone's been doing this the last 50 years, they're probably not going to be as likely to change. But if the right incentives are in place and it's really easy and there's training, it, it makes it a little harder to kind of uh, do the same thing. We know that uh, our neighbors are not very friendly here in Namibia, <laughs> but do you think that being in the center of Europe and being surrounded by uh, yeah. growth? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, 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 get, I, I get what you mean, and it's definitely, I'll, I'll speak about our program specifically, it's 100% helped us, right, because uh, one of the core values of the e-residency program is kind of the, the idea that uh, you get access to a stable environment, and the EU and being part of NATO uh, kind of has provided that for us, because, you know, by itself, uh, you know, Estonia is 1.3 million people. It's not the strongest. I mean, it's very stable, but you know, it's not the strongest or biggest, uh, you know, heavyweight in geopolitics. But being part of these larger organizations has certainly helped us. And of course, uh, the EU has also given funding for for lots of projects to um, helping us kind of get up to speed faster. Of course, I'd say if, if it comes to the entire infrastructure. Um, the entire government, I, I'd say, yeah, it, it probably helps because it allows you a bigger global trading partner as well. Um, it's, it's, I, I'd say it's certainly been a bit of beneficial for the nation, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> One more question, please. Sure. Thanks for the presentation, Joe. And so could you please elaborate more about the typical uh, benefits that an or every Germanian tech startup can get from the e-residency program? Yeah, so um, access to the EU environment uh, is, is one of them. Access to, and, uh, access to uh, certain things like, like PayPal or other online, uh, online tools is one. Um, access to uh, a community of about 40,000 and 5,000 business owners who are you know, actively there. I mean, many people just joined so they could support uh, the community and make sure it grows. Um, and then 100% online uh, administration for um, for the business and and English speaking. So uh, you know, for for me, I was running a company in Germany before this, and uh, you know, it's it's quite difficult as a foreigner to do that. Um, uh, yeah, so so it's you don't have to learn Estonian to do the business. You don't have to uh, you know you don't have to switch to German or French or where, whatever jurisdiction you're going to. Um, of course, uh, yeah. And then there's there's some other benefits like uh, decreased share capital requirements compared to certain jurisdictions. But it also depends where you're comparing to, right? Because uh, the UK also has a very friendly business environment in, in English with a lot of remote administration um, and a uh, very low burden of doing things. But of course, you know, there's also, you know, where, where will they be in two years? We're, we're not sure yet. Um, so it, it's, al it's also that, right? Is it easier to get investment or uh, maybe a venture capital investment if you run on the Estonian residency? Yeah, um, we, we've definitely seen a couple of people use it for that purpose and even to get access to like UN, uh, sorry, to, to EU grant money um, because you're, you're an Estonian entity, right? So you get access to that. Um, we've had a couple of use cases of people doing that and also Estonia has a very solid network of kind of uh, uh, startup and investors. It's not the biggest in the world, but it's very passionate and very up and coming. I mean, Skype transfer wise, um, uh, and Monero and a couple of other uh, companies that are now in the billion dollar club or you know around there are uh, out of Estonia and it's, it's it's very much a startup and digital centered society so for sure um, yeah thank you
As John, I'll just elaborate on what I was Hey, thanks for the presentation, Joel. Uh, one more thing uh, in addition. So, wh what is the relation of your residents with banks and how easy it is to get a loan or funding from a bank uh, in, loan? in Estonia? Okay, a, lo a loan or funding. Um, I'd say it, I'd say probably pretty difficult. Uh, I, you know, actually, you know what? I'll, I'll take that back because I don't know offhand. I haven't heard of very many people going that route uh, where they're where they're getting a loan. Right now, the situation is basically um, uh, there's there's kind of two options when you use e-residency for banking. Uh, well, option one is that if you want to open a kind of a traditional bank account with a traditional lender, uh, you have to go physically to Estonia um, to open the account, which is kind of uh, antithetical to, to what we believe as, I mean, the program is set up digitally and focused on that, right? So we're partnered with more and more fintech providers, uh, transferwise, borderless, Holvi, uh, Payoneer, places like that. So you can run, so you can run everything remotely and set it up remotely, right? But um, I'm, I'm trying to think, I don't know if any of those vendors are doing uh, like small business loans and things like that out of their services. I think not yet for any of them. Um, but just to recap, the opening a bank account for an e-resident is also remote? Uh, so a, a bank account at a traditional bank would not be remote. They would want you to physically go there and meet them, which is why, which is why it's kind of a, a difficult thing when one of the core focuses of e-residency right now is uh, adding fintech partners um, that, that allow you to do it remotely. So those aren't, but those aren't traditional banks with branches. Those are, yeah. Thanks. Of course. I have a question from me. Um, so, uh, you know, recently we have gone through some peaceful revolution in Armenia, <coughs> and now the elections, upcoming elections are in the air. So uh, the tech community in Armenia is uh, somehow involved uh, in finding solutions to uh, secure the integrity of these elections and uh, also make it more digital. So I wonder what is the experience of elections in Estonia and what are some lessons learned from that process? Yeah. Um, so, so in Estonia, you can you can vote remotely uh, in in the elections, um, which is which is really interesting, and it's definitely uh, kind of feeds into the transparency aspect. So, one of the most interesting things. So, people, you know, not only can you vote remotely, which drives up the increased number of people who who then vote because it's easier for them. I, I mean, I'll speak as as an American. We have a significant problem with the amount of people coming out and voting even in national elections because uh, it's usually during the work week, often during business hours, so people have to take a half day off from work and need transportation to a polling center. So I think even just having it online is kind of a significant um, way to increase the turnout of voters and to make it more accessible for everyone in, in the country, right? Um, but then when it comes to additional kind of features or functionality, I think security is a strong um, consideration. Of course, you know, uh, you, you don't want to have a system where, where the opposition party or whoever loses can just cry foul and then you have to do the whole thing paper-based. I mean, it's just a waste, right? So I think building very secure solutions with encryption that not only protect kind of uh, you personally um, as a voter, but also, but also uh, the integrity of your vote is also very important. Um, the, the final feature I'll, I'll mention of kind of the Estonian system is that, you know, uh, some, so we, we also brought this up, a, a foreign government was visiting and they asked just about this and we, you know, they were kind of like, well, this is, this is crazy. What if someone is just forcing people to vote for their candidate? But the way it works in Estonia is that even when you cast your vote, you have up to, until the last minute to recast your vote. So if someone came and came to your house and say, no, vote for this guy, you say, okay, uh, vote for this guy. Um, and then as soon as the guy leaves, you just change your vote, right? Uh, and then, you know, um, of course, uh, you know, of, of course, maybe they could uh, maybe they could come back and check on you or something. Uh, but then, like, as, they would have to literally stay in your house until the second that the that the polls close. So it's uh, it, it makes corruption and kind of this this difficulty um, much harder to pull off at scale. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what if someone else? So uh, I I my understanding. Yeah. Um, the, the question was uh, maintaining anonymity, and I think um, I'll, I'll have to double check this, but I, I think it's still tied to your personal identity. So that's something that might be a different consideration because in, in, in Estonia in particular, we, you know, it's not 
you, you don't you don't have to worry about kind of uh, retribution if you vote for the wrong candidate or you know someone saying you know or people being angry with you because it's uh, that's just not the way it's it's kind of set up as a country. So I'd say it's a, it's kind of a, a different practice that that we have, right? Because uh, everything is supposed to be linked to you. So. And how much does it cost to have a resident Darby example? Sorry, I, I'm not how sure. How much you will be the, the price to have a resident? Yeah. You mean for you to be a resident? No, no, no. Oh. Just to have such program in our community. I'd say we. we it's a little bit hard to say because we were we were able to start the program because it was built on like existing infrastructure that we had already invested and built in. So I mean, like uh, actually, our our program is not very expensive. I, I won't I won't you know say the exact numbers, but it's not. Uh, yeah, it's it's certainly um, not as expensive as you'd think it. I mean, low low millions, right? Do you have some talkings with our government? Uh, may, maybe at higher levels than me, uh, I can I can double check internally, but I'm not sure. We we also just kind of um, more informally host delegations of government officials, whether they're you know kind of kind of it doesn't have to be a formal visit, and they just want to learn about the program. We often host them and kind of show them how we built things and what we did. So, yeah. We will be happy um, to suggest it for us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if if you want to learn more uh, or or want to send a delegation or something, I'm happy to kind of help facilitate. Yeah. So recently, there are, there were some cases when uh, startups were leaving Estonian market because they had some problems with the uh, financial institutions. Financial institutions just cl were closing their bank accounts because they were targeting Ukrainian market, Russian market, and some of them are even Armenian companies. So is this problem solved? What about new companies if they want to? Open a bank account, but they will not be targeting Estonian yeah. Yeah. companies. So, is it okay? Or I mean, yeah, yeah, it's it's now okay, and that's why basically basically what happened was uh, the the financial sector for traditional banks in Estonia is um, pretty limited, and most of the banks operating in the country are actually from uh, our subsidiaries of foreign entities. So when it came to things like um, additional sanctions or kind of uh, um, allegations of money laundering from, from uh, the Russian market through Estonia, some banks were kind of hit and they uh, started closing non-resident accounts as kind of to, to bring down their ratios. What we've basically done is focus more on relationships with um, Estonian banks that are actually from Estonia um, rather than that are based in other countries and then uh, fintech providers who are kind of aware of the situation and have actively agreed to work with us on that. <clears throat> so, okay, thank yeah, much. thank you. <laughs>